Evening, everyone. I'll give you the blurb about me. I'm Scottish. I'm added into a family of nine pets. Anyone familiar with a chinchilla? Near was I. I now have five of them. Um, they're a South American, I want to say rat, but they have really fluffy hair. And they're very cute. You should look up a, a photo of them. I love esoteric programming languages. No one ever puts their hand up to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Anyone write Pony Lang? <laughs> no, all right. Pony Lang is a really cool actor based esoteric programming language. I also love Rust, that usually gets a couple more hands. And of course, I work for Influx Data, so I write a lot of Go as well. Uh, I'm on the Kubernetes release team. I've been for just about a year now, so if anyone wants to talk about Kubernetes after this, um, if you don't like Kubernetes, just don't throw anything at me, we'll get on fine. <laughs> And I'm uh, practicing Stoic, which means I try not to take things too seriously uh, and just kind of roll with the punches. My Twitter handle is here if anyone wants to tweet at me, tweet photos, ask questions, or reach out to me later on at any point. Now, because I am Scottish, uh, we generally speak pretty fast. I'm going to try and slow it down a little bit so that everyone understands me. If I do speed back up again, don't hesitate just to throw something at me or put your hand up. It's, it's perfectly all right. Am I speaking okay just now? People are good. A couple of nods. All right, so I work for a company called Influx Data. We have Back to the Future memes, pictures, trademarks all over the place. I mean, Capacitor, Flux, you know, we, 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 our founder really loves Back to the Future. So I'm going to start this presentation, which is all about InfluxDB2 and a little bit about Flux, um, and just kind of go back to the, the history of InfluxDB and why we felt the need to actually kind of rewind a little bit and, and not start again, but we essentially did start again with InfluxDB2. So InfluxDB1 was released in 2013. It was a solo project, fully written by our CTO, Paul Dix. I think he had some help from someone else at the time. But mostly he was working on it. And it took them about three years before they hit 1.0. Uh, during that time, they actually angered a lot of people. There were some huge breaking changes between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. That happened a couple of times. But the project was still rather successful. So much so that they raised some money and started to build out what we call the full stack monitoring experience. That includes Capacitor, Telegraph, and Chronograph. Chronograph was our UI for InfluxDB. Capacitor gave us the ability to do real-time streaming and anomaly detection of our time series data. And Telegraph, which is by far our most contributed to open source project, allowed people to collect metrics. And you can tell that we've actually ramped up the team drastically because 2016, there was a lot of 1.0s across the board here. So we're starting to find our cadence, things were going well, the project was gaining quite a lot of momentum. This is not a real adoption graph, but it's actually not too far from what our adoption of InfluxDB and the surrounding products was like. Ever since, at least I've been at the company and previously, there has been this linear growth as the time series category has actually been growing. In fact, the fastest growing category of database on dbengines.com is time series and has been for the last three years. Now, I like to think this is because as developers, we're starting to make things a bit more difficult for ourselves. You know, cloud native architectures, Kubernetes, microservices, the infrastructure layer is getting a lot more complicated. I really don't know. I should turn that off now. I'll do it after this talk. Anyway, we're seeing a lot of adoption and you know, the installs are going up all the time. In fact, currently we're at over half a million active reporting installs. The real number are probably far greater because a lot of people do disable the telemetry. So of course it would be madness if someone within the company said, maybe we should start again. You know, who would want to take three or four years worth of a successful open source product, four products that's doing really well and then rewind it and start again? And that's kind of what Influx Data did around two <coughs> years ago, maybe a little bit longer, is it decided to acknowledge the challenges that people were having with InfluxDB1, identify a way to fix them, and unfortunately, the only way to do that was to take a massive step back and rewrite some of the core components. So we don't shy away from the challenges of InfluxDB1. <coughs> we know that people do have pain points. So I'm just going to cover a couple of them here. Um, if you were using Telegraph, Chronograph, or Capacitor, the, a the APIs for all of those products are inconsistent. Right? There's no single API that you can direct your client library to and interact with the, in with the ecosystem. Because these were all deployed separately, the deployment strategy was actually complex, which meant that we actually had to stall the evolution of some products because we had to maintain a level of backwards compatibility across the board. 
which is why we had these evolution constraints. We had to always make sure that we didn't break this in influx, or this in compositor, or this in telegraph. And is anyone unlucky enough here to have tried to write any text script on top of capacitor? No, okay. It's a very challenging language to learn. Once you get good at it, it's very useful. But what we've heard from all of our users and customers is that learning this new language was just too painful. The paradigms didn't reflect to other modern programming languages. With InfluxDB itself, the challenges were cross me uh, measurement across measure math across measurements. It wasn't actually possible to do that. You couldn't pull out the CPU value, a memory value, and do something with both of them together because they were in different series. InfluxQL was actually really, really useful and SQL-like enough that people enjoyed it and could use it very quickly. The challenges were using a SQL-like language for data transformations was also quite difficult as well. So doing anything like linear regression and line or working with multiple series was actually just too painful for InfluxQL to continue being developed. One of the biggest challenges I hear when I go to people or speak to people at conferences is I have hundreds of millions of series in my InfluxDB1 and it's falling apart. Right? High cardinality data wasn't a thing when we started the project six years ago. But now with the evolving infrastructure, microservices, log data, all this, um, you know, di distributed tracing, the cardinality is only going to get worse and worse and worse as these systems advance. InfluxDB1 was also single tenant, which meant it was really hard to run InfluxDB as a service for people. And the developer experience well generally good across the board, the fact that you had four different products to work with. Again, on our forums, the number one question is, how do I do anomaly detection? And the answer is the same every time. Oh, you have to go and deploy this new component next to InfluxDB called Capacitor, go learn TechScript, and then you can maybe do some anomaly detection. So I think we got a developer experience right in InfluxDB, but not as a wider platform. And of course, the last one on the list, security for InfluxDB was opt-in. Right? We've all seen all of the hacks over the last five years with Elastic and MongoDB and others. Op uh, security being uh, something that you can turn on just isn't good enough anymore. So InfluxDB2 uh, tries to address this as well. So now if we jump to the present, InfluxDB2 has a consistent single consistent API. Right, so it doesn't matter which product you're interacting with, we have one API, we have one swagger definition, you can generate one client library and do all of that work from that one location. You no longer have to speak to different products on different ports, etc. This makes interacting and building on top of InfluxDB drastically simpler. InfluxDB2 is multi-tenant, out of the box. That means you can create multiple organizations where the data is you know, unique for each organization, the buckets are unique for each organization, the retention policies are unique for each <coughs> organization, and so forth. So out of the box, you can actually build your own platform on InfluxDB2 without having to hardwire anything else in, which is a really good side effect. It's secure by default. You cannot disable security. The first thing you do when you launch an InfluxDB2 instance is provision a root user. You cannot disable it no matter what you try. I mean, you could fork the code and remove it all, but that's obviously far too much effort. But this is good. This means that there's not, no longer going to be any rogue InfluxDB instances on the internet without security that people can steal all their data. Hmm. And InfluxDB2 has built in task and job processing. So this is very similar to what people had to use Capacitor for in the past. Except now it's built into the engine. You have the ability to go and create a task pull out any random amount of data, do some processing on that data, and fire off alerts without ever leaving InfluxDB. And this, of course, uses our new query language, which is called Flux. And we'll be taking a look at that in just a moment. But because all of this is a single API, it's also a single binary. So to deploy InfluxDB2, you just put the binary on the machine and run it. There's a single Docker image you can run. And it just removes all of that coupling that we had with four different products. And the challenge there was people couldn't use Chronograph or Capacitor without InfluxDB. So we thought let's just bundle it all together and give people a cohesive and hopefully developer experience friendly product. And that's where, this is where it's all going. We really focus on the developer experience. We don't want people to add new tools. We want them to be able to do everything in a single place. We've really focused on making the UI integral to the entire experience. Things like user management, creating dashboards, creating telegraph configurations can all be done through a very simple UI. 
And we've even added new cooler stuff for the developers who want to automate everything as well. So during the demo today, we're going to take a look at a very new feature, which is about six days old, but it should still work, called Packager, which applies a Kubernetes manifest style format to creating buckets and users and dashboards, telegraph configs and so forth. So developer experience is first and foremost when we're talking about adding anything new to the product, that's how are developers going to find us. And of course, cardinality. One billion series is the number that we're throwing around internally. Right? InfluxDB was really good to dozens of millions, maybe at the fringe of 100 million, but it really started to slow down. With InfluxDB2, we're aiming at a billion and then further on than that. So we do want you to use InfluxDB for centralized and logging, for distributed tracing, and for all your metrics. And then the new superhero here is supposed to be Flux. I'm hoping that when we go through the language specification here that you find it familiar easy to pick up and understand how it's working with your data to make your data work for you. Has anyone used Flux yet? All right, okay. <laughs> you don't count. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to dive into the language. I'm going to show you some of the primitives and then we'll end with a demo of InfluxDB2. I'm going to walk you through the UI, creating dashboards, users, all of that, and then I'll take some questions. This should hopefully take around another 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll take a five minute break. So Flux is a data processing language. It's functional, so if you've written any functional programming languages before, hopefully it feels relatively familiar. It borrows the pipe forward operator from F Sharp, Elixir, and some other languages. It's extensible and composable. You can actually consume the Flux language uh, as a library in Go to build your own, own tooling on top of it, or from Rust, I believe now. And it's composable, so you can write your own Flux packages and publish them on the internet for other people to consume. This is not something that was ever possible with InfluxDB1 and InfluxQL. It works with multiple sources and syncs. Our most successful product is Telegraph, and it's because it works with anything. You can use Telegraph to collect metrics and write them to Postgres, to Datadog, to New Relic, or to InfluxDB. And we're taking the exact same approach with Flux. So Flux can read data from CSV, MySQL, MariaDB, and so forth, and it will also support writing to other targets too. That's still a work in progress. Um, I believe right now we support HTTP and MQTT, but more are coming very soon. It's also streaming, and that's really important. That's not something that was possible in InfluxDB1 either. And what that means is that you can actually return an infinite set of streams or data over the Flux protocol, and you'll never max out the memory on the box. So that's very, very cool. And this is what it looks like. So the first thing we want to do is specify a bucket. So uh, buckets of the new database in InfluxDB2, if you're familiar with InfluxDB1, a bucket and a retention policy, or a database and a retention policy grouped together is essentially a bucket. We then want to filter the data on a date range. So we just pipe it forward, use the range function, and we can use the start and stop parameters in that function. What we have here is actually a duration literal, which is built into the language. So I don't have to work out or use functions to calculate timestamps. I can just do minus 10 minutes ago, minus one hour ago, minus one week ago, minus one month ago, and so forth. Once we filter the data on the date, we then want to actually filter on measurements and fields. This is now starting to shape the data that we're going to come back. So here I can say that I want to only get CPU measurements from this time series, and I specifically want one single field, which is a usage user, which is just a Linux load average parameter. That all makes sense. I've got at least one nod, so that'll do. Flux allows, you, uh, Flux allows you to define your own functions. If you're familiar with JavaScript, this should look pretty similar to you. So here we're saying that square equals, it takes a single parameter and it returns that multiplied by itself. Nice and simple. I guess the things that are kind of useful here is that this is all type inference, so it's going to work out which, which type to apply to the functions, um, and that is all available through the EST and the Go library as well. And we actually released a VS Code extension just a few weeks ago, which is really cool. Unfortunately, if I write this square function and I want to take all of the series from a bucket, filter it by the date range, and then square all the values, that's not possible. And understanding this is the single biggest hurdle that I have when I meet people at events and they want to understand more about Flux. And the reason is, is that the primitive of Flux is a table or a series of data. And the way that you define the functions has to be 
typed in a way that it can handle that stream of data. So what is a table? It's essentially a schema or a series, depending on how you want to look at it. It uses annotated CSV across the wire. Um, so if you want to use other tools to look into it, that is you know, very easily possible. But when we put on our time series data, it's just going to be anytime the schema changes in the data, it's going to return a new table. And I think this is just best looked at by example. So this is the annotated CSV format. The first one, the first row of any table is always the schema or the column names. And then we have some data below. So here we can just see that the result or the series is my result. We have one single table, which is table zero. We then have some start and top values. Go away. Uh, and then we have what just looks like regular time series data, hopefully. Something a bit more practical, if you're working with financial data, then you may be used to querying NASDAQ information. So here we'd say that we have a you know, measurement called stocks. We have two tables because there's two different series. So we have the Apple ticker on the NASDAQ and we have the Google ticker on the NASDAQ. And then we have the values over time. But of course, if we want to work across series, again, something that wasn't possible previously, then we can just modify the group key on this series to pivot or unpivot that around depending on what we're trying to do. So if I take the same information from stocks with the range and now I actually say I want to group on the market, what we're actually going to do is flip this around and we're only going to have a single table with the tickers and time-based order because the market is the same so we only have a single group. Now let's go back to this example. How do we make the square function work if we want to work on a series of data? So this is where the language can get a little bit funky for the first time user, but we actually have to tell the signature of this function that we're going to have streaming data coming in. So we just say tables equals, and that is the pipe in operator, I guess, which says a stream of data is going to come, <coughs> and then all streams of data have to be mapped over, and then you can have an anonymous function that works on the data. Again, we're still in the realm of JavaScript here, minus the pipe forward operator. But hopefully it feels familiar enough that if you were to pick this up and write it, you would, you would get on OK. Now that's a flying whirlwind tour of flux. And then the only really thing I really wanted to cover was the tables, because it is the biggest pain point. But there is so much more to the language. You can define your own functions. We have MapReduce capabilities. The aggregations and windowing stuff is really, really powerful. And we'll take a look at that uh, during one of the demos. Histograms are built into the language. So you no longer have to pre-aggregate all of that data when you insert it into your TSDB. You can do that at query time. Really powerful when you can change the windows and change how you want to work out what an anomaly is. We already looked at filtering. What's also really cool is regular expression matching is built into the language too. So you can prefix any equal sign with a tilde and that's you've got a regex expression. There are loads of string functions, including string interpolation, quantiles, and so forth. I'm not going to go through all of that because it's a lot. But as you can imagine, this language is now, I think, around 18 months old and continually evolving. It's one of our biggest teams internally, and we expect this language to grow drastically over the next kind of three to six months. All right, let's take a look at all this. So this is my plan, so that I don't mess it up too much. First of all, spin up the container. I'll take a look at my make file, make up. And I've had to echo out all the commands as well, so if you're familiar with, oh, it's not big enough, is it? There we go. If you're familiar with Docker, we're just running the Influx DB 2.00 beta, we're sleeping for five seconds just to give the database a few seconds to actually get healthy. And then we've created the credentials through a command line, uh, through a command. So if I pull up this make file, and just if we ignore the Docker container exec stuff, because it's not important, and just do an influx setup, passing through some default values, the name of the organization, the name of the user, my password, which is very plain, a token that I want pre-authorized for any future API requests. And I know I'm throwing quite a lot at you here, but feel free to ask questions at any time. And then the dash F just says force it, create it, let's go. Next, 
I'm going to use the packager command that I spoke about earlier. So this is for anyone who's interested in infrastructure as code and being able to define everything through YAML. Because everybody loves YAML. Sure. <laughs> this is very, very on purpose intended. Whatever word I'm looking for that I can't find. This looks like a Kubernetes manifest. The reason is we're actually going to support Kubernetes as a target and have an operator that will accept this and work with InfluxDBs in a Kubernetes environment. What we're doing here is we're saying kind bucket, which means I want to create a bucket. We have some metadata, we give it a name, my bucket, nice and original. Then the spec says, okay, this has a description. I should actually probably live in metadata, I'll raise that. And then we have some retention rules for this bucket. So I'm going to say expire all data after one hour, which is 3,600 seconds. I can then do make bucket. And if you just ignore all the Docker nonsense, what we have here, in fact, let's just pull up the make file, that'll be a lot easier. There. So we have influx pkg. We specify the organ in organization and the token. The host, so I'm just pointing it to my influx db, which is in the container. That's the telegraph, not the bucket. There we go. And then the YAML file that I want to apply. So influx pkg, some organization and token stuff to do the authentication, and then the name of the YAML file, and that goes away and creates it. There we go. So what we have here is it actually previews what we're about to create. So it says, okay, you're going to create this new bucket. It's called my bucket with a retention period of one hour and this description. I can confirm it. The bucket gets created. I get back an ID if I want to build other automation on top of it. And that's it. And I have a bucket. Although I don't expect you to trust me. So this is the login screen for InfluxDB2 with the new UI. And if I come over here to buckets, we have my bucket. So YAML file, influx package, nice and simple. Stick that in your CI system or your Kubernetes pipeline and things start to get a little bit more interesting. Next on my to-do list of tricks is do the same for a telegraph configuration. So what does that mean first? What we've found by speaking to people is that getting InfluxDB up and running is fine, but the getting the data part in can be a little bit challenging. If they don't know or are not familiar with Telegraph enough, that configuration in TOML format, again, throws people off their tracks. What you can actually do now from the UI, and we're, again, this is our developer experience improvements, is say, create a configuration. And right now we support five different modules, but we're going to expand this out with every Telegraph plugin eventually. I'll just do system monitoring. I click continue. I'll call this UI system. And it gives me the commands that I need to go run that telegraph and start scraping all the system metrics on my machine and send them to InfluxDB. I'm just going to close that because I already have one that I want to use. And that is telegraph.yaml. So much like our bucket one, the only thing I'm doing different here is I'm going to create a label first so I can label this configuration. And this label is just called user raw code. So it's just so I can identify it as my resource. We have the association here. So we're associating my label with the telegraph configuration. And then the spec just wants the entire raw toml from telegraph. So here I can specify a five second interval with omitting the host name. I tell it where to write to influx dbv2 pass in the token that I pre offed and then I enable all the system plugins. What that means now is I can do make telegraph, say yes, and I give myself a handy hint where I can run telegraph with that ID. So the ID is here. Influx token. Now Telegraph is running. It's configured with the, all of the system plugins that I wanted it to run with. And if we jump over here to the Explorer view, we'll take a look at that now that some data is hopefully just about to come in. So what I'll do is I'll set the window to be five minutes, turn on auto refresh. 
And the flush interval is 10 seconds, so I just need to wait. Don't look at me like that, it's going to work. <laughs> there we go. So, five second refresh, five minute window. Let's take a look at the CPU. And we, so now we've got some data right away. The Influx package is really good. It works for pretty much every resource within Influx, which is very cool. What we have here is the new UI with the query builder. Is that what I've got next on my notes before I deviate too much? My computer just crashed. No? VS Code crashed? Let's reopen. I'm getting worried. <laughs> Let's just do it. Oh. Oh, I keep freezing. Right, let's just shut that down for two seconds. All right. Telegraph running again. Okay, so this is the query builder. So I can just click on measurements, say disk. I want to monitor the free value, click submit. What's really cool here is if I click on the script editor, it'll actually get me the flux for that query that I've just built. So without learning Flux the hard way, you can actually use the UI to piece enough of the query together to then jump in and actually start typing it yourself. Assuming we want to do some sort of aggregation over a re-windowing, we could just hover over this aggregate window. It gives me all the parameters, of course, but if I just click it, it will actually fill in some defaults. So it says every one minute, calculate the mean, re-window the data, and click Submit, and it does that. So the UI is aimed at making you productive without necessarily understanding Flux itself, but hoping that you'll actually move to the, the script editor and learn the language as you go. So now what I'm going to do is another developer-focused aspect, is I'm going to come here, say, create a dashboard from a template. Again, work in progress, but we're adding templates for all the modern stacks that we are familiar with and that other people are suggesting to us. So we have Docker, uh, Kubernetes, JMeter, Nginx, Redis, System, etc. So here I can create a new system dashboard, click on it, and that's all pre-configured without me doing anything. To create a downsampling task. Okay, so I want to show you the UIs, the, the capacitor stuff that now no longer exists that lives in this. How do I downsample data very quickly? Well, I'm going to start with the query builder first, so instead of going straight into task mode. The query builder should be your first place you go to understand how to do anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want all the CPU data. I'm going to take the usage guest. And this is the value I have here. This is collected at a five second interval. And I only want one minute averages. So I can drop down to the script editor. And I click aggregate window. We'll just use the default one minute, calculate the mean. We now have lower resolution data. And all I'm going to do is copy that script, come over to task <coughs> mode, and say create a new task. Here I'll say down sample CPU. I'm going to run it every five seconds because I want it to work right now. Paste in that same script. And all I have to do here is add on one new function, which says two. So once I've down sampled the data, I have to store it in a new bucket with a new retention policy. And what I'm going to do is store it in my bucket, which is called raw code. And I think it needs an org ID. I should have looked that up before I did it. Which I think is also raw code. Let's quickly work out what my org ID is. I think you would org instead of org. Was it just org? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Let's try org on its own. When in doubt, pull up the dots. Uh, so here I can say search, find a two function. No, wait, we're still on aggregate. Click that. Oh, screw it. Our new documentation is really good. It's on v2.docs.influxdata. 
There's a terrible search terminal, isn't it, too? Okay, it wasn't. <laughs> Sorry. Let's call it stage pressure. Let's go back to org. The problem was, in my dashboard explorer query, we're actually using variables from the dashboards. So my time here um, was set to a parameter v, which doesn't exist. But we can actually just remove that. And now we have a downsampling task that's going to run every five seconds, calculate the one minute average, and write that into a new bucket. Now, what we've heard, I'm kind of going over time, but hopefully we'll be done in a few minutes. What we heard from people that were using Capacitor is debugging text scripts was really painful. There was no logs from when the scripts ran. So what we've done now is actually given people the ability to view all the task runs, see that it failed, I'm assuming my bucket name is wrong, and then view the logs. So I'm not going to bother fixing that, but I'll maybe do it towards the end if we have enough time. Next, uh, create a check from the UI. So if you want to do alerting, we now have this new monitoring alerting tab. I could say create a dead man check, and I'm using the same builder that I'm already familiar with, where I just pick a value and I say OK. I can then modify this check quickly and just say if I don't see data for five seconds, set this status to critical and save. Now, my favorite app in the world is rbox.app, which gives you a fake HTTP endpoint. And what I'm going to do is set it up as a target for my notifications. You would imagine this could be like PagerDuty, OpsGenie, or something else. I'll call it rbox. Create that, and then we just have to join those two together with a rule. So CPU run every five seconds so we can get it going quickly. And whenever the status equals critical, send it to our box. Now that I've created that rule, we should wait about five seconds after I stop telegraph. So we've got no more data anymore. Sorry, this is an awful lot. <laughs> but hopefully you're following along. Telegraph is no longer writing metrics, which means this alert should trigger and I'll give that another 10 seconds and see if we get an alert. Was there anything else to cover? Yes, okay, so now that I have all of this in place, some of it was applied through Packager, some of it I created through the UI. If I want to pull all of that data back out, I'll run my make export target, which is just another Docker command, which runs influx pkg export. And what does that give me? A YAML file with the entire state of my entire influx DB that I can apply from any other CI job or any other instance of influx DB. And I never got my alert, so what we can do is click here. It definitely went to critical. In your checkpoint, you, you had the um, yeah. default HTTP URL in addition to your uh, Airbox one. Ah. You should have said mm -hmm. at the end you see the HTTP WW. Uh. <laughs> uh, amateur hour over here. All right, so. That may or may not, because if I broke it, we can give it another five seconds. But that's InfluxDB2, an introduction to Flux language. Hopefully you can see where we're going with this. We want to give you a full monitoring stack that can be either UI driven for no code or low code users, something that is completely automatable for YAML scripts and other means for the developers and operators, and then hopefully a nice mixture of developer friendly stuff in the middle that keeps you happy regardless of what side of the fence you're on. So that's InfluxDB2, and I'll quickly take questions and a break. Any questions? For so the export, it's uh, all or nothing, or, is it, or can you like, like filter like uh, I don't? You just want my data and not the other one. Yes, yeah, so you only get your organization as long as you have a token for that organization. But you can also do filters to say only give me certain resources instead. So that's where the labels come in really, really handy. So yeah, you can take out your entire org or just your own stuff, and it'll work just fine. Anything else?
about your first uh, problem you showed us uh, with the, the function which could not be applied, why not having a, a function which tablify or enable, enables a, a normal function to be applied on all the, the elements of the table, like functional language do? So you would have to use map to run arbitrary functions. So my square function without the without the stream function header, I could have used map and just passed the square function and as an anonymous function to it. That would have worked just like a functional language. But um, you can also just write your own stream transformation functions very very quickly by modifying the RRT and doing the map inside. So okay, so you have to do two modes in fact. You can do it either way, yeah, for sure. Uh, if I understood well, you 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 implemented a kind of mean based on periodic. Uh, yes, so can you do it uh, with event trigger too? With what trigger? To event trigger, for example, one uh, one new event that comes to the to your time series and then it triggers. Oh, definitely. Yeah, so you could have a task that monitors that time series for a particular. Uh, event with a certain structure or certain values and that in turn could then call other functions or other tasks and trigger <coughs> them that way but the, the most simplest use case uh, in this scenario is just to have a task that takes all of our time series data at five second resolution uh, calculates the mean over one minute and then stores it for long term like that's the the first use case normally is it possible to, um, to have um, a trigger maybe in this aggregation and and make uh, a call to uh, an external webhook yeah, there are functions for working with JSON, HTTP APIs, uh, and we're adding support for like PagerDuty, OpsGenie, and a whole bunch of other things. So yeah, you can build any integration that way you wish. And um, also, uh, in terms of uh, redundancy and stuff like that for resilience, well, uh, I haven't seen in your presentation uh, how you can have a single, uh, is there a single node or? So right now, because it's in beta, it's a single node, but we will be releasing uh, horizontal scalability as we or uh, just after GA, hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Maybe you could specify the different products like the Influx Cloud, what what you can do with it, and the Influx OSS and how they differ. Maybe yeah, so this is the open source one. You can download the Docker container or the binary and start playing with it now. We do have a hosted SaaS solution, which is redundant, resilient, horizontally scalable, all for you, and you pay per usage. So how much data you send in, I think it's like 0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.15 uh, cents per gig. Um, and you can just store your data there. You can actually use the free tier, which means you can store data with a 72 hour retention period uh, without ever adding a credit card. And then if you do want to scale up, we can give you a, you can use the pricing calculator and go, this is what my data looks like. This is what I think I'll be charged. And it'll try and predict that for you as well. So if you, if you need redundancy or resiliency now for InfluxDB2, our cloud product is great. Um, and my next talk, what I'm actually going to talk about are some strategies where you can use both, where you use the cloud for redundancy, resiliency, and long-term storage, but you still need immediate real-time data at the edge. And that's what I'm talking about next. So, and, so you mean clustering would be supported with the open source version? Sorry, this is my bad year. Like for clustering, like uh, Will there be clustering on open source? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was, as I say, one of the issues of the one .x version. Yes, yeah, so we had an enterprise license. Uh, with InfluxDB2, there will still maybe be an enterprise license. I'm not entirely sure about those details. But to the best of my knowledge, there will be some level of horizontal scalability for free. Okay. But I can't commit to that, and you never heard me say it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you add uh, tags on, uh, on the table? In, uh, for example, so this was CPU, uh, etc. But it can be CPU on a single uh, pod uh, a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, maybe uh, you have uh, multiple pods in your application, and you want to have CPU for the I don't know the first part of the application you have, you and you want to have tags, etc. You can put as many as, as you many want. as you want. Okay. This is the one we're pushing to a billion series, so you can, you can go crazy on your tagging as much as you want. You, just remember that by default, every series has its own table, yeah. so you then have to understand your group keys and how you want to group when you pull that data back out. But you can add tags that you will. And then you can uh, group them, or yeah, I don't know, average some, etc. Uh, oh yeah, well. definitely. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I... I mean, because I'm using the default telegraph thing, we may have a couple of tags, so if I look at 
uh, oh, I killed Telegraph, so let's do it. CPU, uh, look at idle, and if I drop this, no, I don't have any tags. Oh, disk will though, won't it? Yeah. yeah, so here I've got the, the file system type and I can group by ext4 and then take a look at what I have free. So you can actually filter by the tags as you go on the UI, which just filters over here to the script, which is just another filter. So, okay. yeah. And just these tags uh, are part of the amount of data that you pay for in when you are in the cloud, uh, in the cloud version, because in fact, at the end, if you look at all of these things, the amount of data spent to send numbers is just um, nothing compared to the size of, of, of tags, usually. Yes. And so, uh, uh, for what type of data do you pay? And because uh, I know on the infrastructure, two tags are much more expensive uh, than uh, the real data, usually. So, with Infos Cloud 2, there is a cap on cardinality, but I don't think we charge you until you hit that cap. <coughs> And then once you hit the cap on, say it's 5 million series, that you have to speak to us and we come to some sort of arrangement to increase that up. You pay for the data transfer in and out of your cluster and the retention, so how long you want to store that data. I can't remember the exact method for calculating cost, um, but it's something we're still tweaking. We, we just dropped the cost a lot last week um, yeah. because it was working out too expensive. So we're continually trying to improve that and make it comparable and compete with all of our competitors. You should speak to our sales, our product or sales team, and, and they can give you much more details for sure. All right, if there are no more questions, we'll take a couple of. Oh, uh, yeah, go for it. How do you compare Flux uh, as a stream processing with uh, products like uh, Spark Streaming and Flink, for example? Yeah, I think there are some, some similarities. Um, I, I haven't done any research on direct comparisons, but we can maybe talk during the break about what features you're interested in from that side and whether Flux would be useful there or not. Um, it depends on your use case what you want to do with it, I'm afraid. All right, let's take five minutes and then we'll do the Telegram talk. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.